Well, my dear friends, Halloween is finally upon us, and I've chosen to celebrate with a fine collection of stories for your listening to light this evening. All of these shared with me via Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up, so I could read the stories that you shared directly with me, all set to the relaxing sounds of a thunderstorm. Now, this is also a chance for me to promote my second channel. I know, a second channel, can you believe it? Yes, indeed. Now, over here at the vault, I concentrate on longer stories, but at the dungeon, I do the shorter ones, five to ten minutes. And I've brought together some of the most recent ones I've done over there, plus some original stuff that's never been performed before. So, my dear friends, it's time to sit back and relax with your favorite drink. And listen. My friend Adam and I rented a cabin in early July at Letchworth State Park in western New York. We wanted to see its massive gorges and picturesque waterfalls for ourselves, after hearing so much about this so-called Grand Canyon of the East. During our visit, we drove through and hiked much of the 17-mile-long park, and it certainly lived up to its hype. However, we only ended up staying one night at our cabin. The D cabins were a small grouping of one-room lodges in the southeastern quarter of the park. They're in a remote area of Letchworth, in that most tourists and hikers congregate on the western side of the Genesee River Gorge. Adam and I were practically alone in the congregation of eight or so cabins when we arrived. A man and a woman from a neighboring cabin were packing up to leave, as we were unpacking our car, and they kindly handed us a watermelon before they left. They seemed to be in a hurry, so we didn't chat with them for very long. Once they were gone, there were only two other occupied cabins, but they were distant enough from us that we never really saw much of those people during our night stay. We didn't hang around the cabin long once the car was unloaded. We were on our way to a trailhead when we spotted a Civil War parade field with a cannon and memorial. It was strange seeing an empty field and barren picnicking area in a popular state park in July, so I commented that the field must be haunted by Civil War ghosts. Adam suggested that we should revisit it some night and see for ourselves. The hike itself was fun. We found our way down to the river canyon and eventually crossed over to the western side and saw one of the waterfalls. When we returned to our cabin that evening, it was already twilight. We played a few board games, ate sandwiches, then put down our folding cots. The cabin was basically the size of a kitchen. It had a small stove and refrigerator, a tiny table with two chairs, and two rolling cots. Once they were down, it was difficult to move anywhere. Scratched into the log walls were the countless names and dates of past occupants. Friends, lovers, and vandals all made their presence known, some from as far back as the 1970s. Well, we weren't the sort of people to carve our names into a cabin. Oh, look at that. A pentagram, said Adam. I went over and inspected the star. There were some symbols I didn't recognize around it. It stood out because every other carving seemed to be either an expression of love or just a record of someone's presence. Ah, oh, jeez, great. We're staying in the devil's cabin, I said, grinning. Adam shrugged it off and we moved on. We eventually sat down for a round of cards and had a few drinks. Hey, how about we cut that watermelon open, said Adam. With what? I asked. There was no cutlery of any kind in the cabin. <laughs> Good question, said Adam. Oh, I think I have a pocket knife in my bag. He retrieved his Swiss Army style knife and it took about 15 minutes with the small blade struggling to cut through the rind. But eventually we were able to pry the melon into halves. Nasty, said Adam, as we revealed the black, gooey rot which had consumed the melon. The molded innards began to run onto the floor from my half. It seemed to have liquefied as soon as it was exposed to the air. Quick, toss it. We both heaved our portions of the stinking, sopping mess out the cabin door. It was a unique rot, a sweet, fetid decomposition. Adam and I cleaned up the floor and laughed at the gift our neighbors had left for us. We then returned to our game, but 
Soon enough we were nodding off, and eventually agreed that it was time for bed. It was still relatively early, but it was dark, and we were beat from a full day of hiking. I fell asleep immediately and slept for hours, before I was rudely awakened by a knock at the cabin door. Honestly, it was more of a rumbling, like someone was shaking the door as opposed to knocking it. Darkness had enveloped the cabin, inside and out, and I couldn't hear much of anything with the small fan that was blowing in the window, only a yard or so from my head. I got up, looked to Adam, who was still sleeping, then checked my phone for the time. It was 2.30 a.m. It was an eerie feeling. The uncertainty of who was at the door at that hour. I was tense, though not yet scared, as I'd been camping a time or two when a ranger or park attendant had interrupted my night's sleep for various reasons. Sometimes it was because someone was missing in the area, and sometimes it was for maddening reasons, like two tents were too close to each other, even though we'd rented two adjoining campsites, so that we could camp together. I flipped the outside light on and unlocked the door, then slowly cracked it open to look out. I was in my boxes and a t-shirt, so I immediately felt self-conscious when I saw it was an old woman out there. Can I help you? I asked. I couldn't get a good look at her face, as it was mostly obscured by the dark. She had a hunchback, and her long, scraggly grey hair was tucked into a green army jacket. She then held up something, and I realised she was offering it to me. I have an extra candle loop. Would you like it? I didn't immediately reply, as I was floored by how rude she'd been to wake me up so early in the morning just to offer me a cantaloupe. I assumed she was crazy and wanted to get back to bed, so I simply said that I would take her melon. I cracked the door enough to reach out and receive the fruit. Enjoy, she said. I thanked her and closed the door. I peeked out of the window to make sure she was leaving, and once she drifted off into the night, I turned off the outside light, tossed the cantaloupe onto the stove and went back to bed. I couldn't get back to sleep, as I pictured the old crone watching the cabin from somewhere close by. I thought of the unsolved Keddie murders, a family who were gruesomely murdered one night at a cabin in California. A couple of children were left unharmed in another room, and had slept through the brutal slayings, and no one who was staying in any of the neighbouring cabins had heard anything either. I wondered if Adam would have woken up if the old woman had stabbed me through the door, as opposed to handing me a melon. There were a few mosquitoes and moths in the cabin now, so I was also having real and imagined encounters with them, which prolonged my sleeplessness. I couldn't quite stretch my legs, as I would touch the walls, and didn't like the idea of creepy crawlies having easy access to me. But I was still tired, so eventually I drifted off back to sleep. I'm not sure how long I slept, but it wasn't yet dawn, as everything was still incredibly dark. But I was awoken again, this time more gradually, by a man's voice in the area. I couldn't understand what he was saying at first, and I figured he was still some distance away. But when I got up to peek out of the window, I quickly realized that someone was standing just outside the door. I couldn't quite make him out, but I could hear that he was talking low, not whispering, but speaking in hushed tones. The fan made it difficult to understand what he was saying, but it felt too weird and was too much of an unknown just to confront him, so I woke Adam up. What? Adam's eye went wide in the minuscule amount of light that came in from the moon and the bathroom building which was just down the road. It sounds like some guy outside the cabin. He's talking to himself. Huh? What time is it? He sat up, seeming to understand that I was scared, and this was some sort of situation. After three, maybe a little after four, I don't know, I said. An old lady came by an hour ago and knocked on the door. Now, this guy's out there. Turn on the light. I got up and leaned over the table and flipped both switches. 
One illuminated the inside of the cabin, and the other the outside. Adam got up and went to the door, cracking it. What's going on? Why are you here so late? Adam blocked my view of the outside, so I couldn't see who he was talking to. No, we don't want that, he stated. We want to get some rest. It's the middle of the night. I heard a response, but couldn't make out what was said. Then Adam closed the door. What did he want? Adam flipped the outside light off. He turned to me, and I noticed that his face had lost much of its color. He was looking past me when he spoke. It wasn't a man. It was an old lady. Now, I could have sworn I'd heard a man talking out there. The old woman I'd spoken to earlier hadn't sounded like a man. Was she wearing a green jacket? Yeah, I assume it's the same old bag. <laughs> she gave me this cantaloupe. I didn't finish my thought, as when I turned to the stove to retrieve the melon, I found it cracked and covered in a dark mold, with tiny worms and larvae squirming all over it. That's nasty, dude, said Adam, nearly retching when he saw it. Why would you bring that in here? It wasn't like that when I took it. I grabbed a plastic shopping bag and picked up the disgusting cantaloupe, opened the door and tossed it outside. I locked the door and we huddled over the table. What did she say to you? I asked. I couldn't really hear over the fan. She said something about having lived in this cabin during the off-season. Then she tried to hand me a knife. What? I know. She wanted me to take this knife. She said I didn't have one big enough to cut my friend's melon. We stayed awake and vigilant until dawn. Thankfully, without any further visitations. As soon as there was enough light, we packed up the car and left the cabin village. We had no intention of staying another night at the Devil's Cabin. When I was a kid, my sister Jenny and I used to go to a babysitter that lived only two houses away. Our babysitter, Mary, had two girls, Lauren and Leah. Lauren is older, my sister's age, and we used to tell each other ghost stories when we all got home from school. We would be at Lauren and Leah's house reading from Scary Stories to Tell in the Dark or In a Dark, Dark Room all fall and winter long. Lauren would make up her own version of In a Dark, Dark Room which would usually end up in her basement and specifically within a chest in her basement. For all the years I went over to my babysitters I was never allowed to go down into the basement. Lauren would bring me to the kitchen sometimes and tell me to look through the cracks in the floorboards as she turned on the basement light. I would see the locked chest that she always spoke of, and she would claim that she'd seen someone walking around in the basement, opening and closing the chest while her dad was at work and her mum upstairs. When a girl in the neighborhood disappeared, Lauren's story eventually grew to include her as the phantom hiding out in the basement. April Pike had been every kid in the neighborhood's babysitter at some point or another. She was a teenager when she disappeared, and had never been found. I spent countless hours peering through the floorboards, but never saw Lauren's ghost. Years later, I purchased the house between my childhood home and my old babysitter's. I kept an eye on the driveway entrance to the basement next door. It was like... I was always anticipating something strange, even otherworldly, emerging from it. My babysitter and her husband had moved across town years prior, so it seemed silly to still be thinking about the chest. I knew that the current owners had remodeled the basement and were using it as a den, but I couldn't help but wonder if the chest was still there. One night, in early January, my neighbors were rushing to move out, piling all their worldly belongings into pickup trucks, going up and down the driveway for hours. I assumed that the bank was repossessing their house, since they were leaving in such a hurry. When I got up the next morning and looked outside, 
I saw that they'd left the basement door wide open. I watched the door for a while. Snow had piled up, and some had even spilled into the doorway overnight. There were no boot prints in the snow in the driveway, so I knew no one was coming back any time soon. I put on my coat and shoes and went out my own basement sliding glass door into my backyard. I was going to go next door. I walked through the gate which swung out into my neighbor's driveway, then headed right into my neighbor's basement to have a look around. There was no furniture remaining, but half of the floor was carpeted. There were paint cans and shelves near the steps that led to the first floor, and there was also the chest. I knew it was the same chest because of the ornate, now rusted lock. From the cracks in the floorboards, I could always see the top of the chest and part of the front, which included a heart-shaped lock. I tried prying it open with my hands, but the lock was secure. I felt little reservation in breaking the lock off with a hammer that I found nearby. There was no way it properly belonged to my neighbors who had just moved out. The thing hadn't been opened in decades, so I held my breath and opened the chest anticipating that I would find the mummified remains of that missing teenage girl from when I was a kid. For some reason, I was keen on my babysitter's husband having been the murderer. I was disappointed to find a few musty blankets and a couple of throw rugs inside. I closed the chest and tossed the broken lock into a nearby bucket. When I turned, my heart tightened in my chest, and I thought I'd been found out. There were a few smaller shoe prints in the snow, next to my size 14s. I peeked out the door, looked up and down the driveway, then back inside, but saw no one. It was peculiar, because the smaller prints didn't come into the basement, but merely headed out the door. I followed them up the driveway through the swinging gate on my fence, and into my backyard, then onto my sliding glass door, which was now cracked open. I knew I hadn't left it open, as it is way too cold outside, and my gas bill was already too high. When I opened the door, I found three snow prints leading into my house. I have to admit that lately, I've been having terrible dreams about my other neighbor's teenage daughter. The first time I saw one of the black ambulances, my mother had just picked me up from my cardiologist to drive me home. <laughs> Mum had a music on and was singing to Patsy Klein. So I leaned my head against the window and watched pissed off drivers pull into the slow lane to pass us. Yeah, Mum refuses to accept that driving too slowly is as bad as speeding. <sighs> Flow of traffic, Ma. In the rear view mirror, I caught a flash of black and scowled as an Audi passed us with an ambulance on its tail. Now, if there's one thing I know, it's ambulances. I go for a nice ride in them a few times a year. They're big and boxy, and full of really sexy first responders, and they come with a whole show. Lights, sirens, cops, fire trucks. Once, the house across the street caught fire at the same time I developed chest pains, and my little suburban street turned into a morbid rave. Of course, this means I also know what ambulances aren't, like black or silent especially when running under lights. The ambulance stayed on the Audi's tail, illegally close, I should add, the whole time I tried to get my mom's attention. Stacy, she finally said, slowing down even more. What the hell is that following the green Audi that just passed us? Well, it's going to be a ticket as soon as a cop catches him. You didn't see the black thing? What? The pickup? Oh, he's not even in the same lane. I sighed. Oh, never mind. My mom misses a lot, especially when she's driving. 
However, you'd have to be deaf, blind, and dead to miss a giant black ambulance glued to someone's bumper. We stopped at a local hot dog joint for some lunch. My shoulder popped out of joint when I got out of the car, but I got it back in before Mom could see. She had a monster kielbasa in a bun and gave me a nasty look when I snitched some of her fries. I turned to the TV while I ate. They went cold and dry in my throat when I saw the Audi from the highway on a newsflash. It blew a tire and veered into an underpass pile. No survivors. I must have gone pale because Mom took my wrist and counted my pulse. When she finished, she stood from Abu. Hang on a minute, kiddo. I'll get you a box so you can go home and rest. For once, I didn't argue. When you have a genetic condition that sends you to the hospital every time your stomach hurts, you get to know your locals. The EMTs, paramedics, firefighters, even a few cops. So, when the internet turned up nothing but Marvel stuff, and a few places that paint their ambulances black, I looked up Bud. Now, yeah. Bud isn't really Bud. His name is Harlan G. Gates Jr. Due to his hobbies in the days before he became an EMT, he picked up the nickname Bud. Well, I'll leave you to decide how he got it. Anyway, Bud had picked me up and checked me over enough times so we were just short of married. He's a good guy. Invited me to his wedding. Even his wife has called me to check up and chat after I've seen the guys professionally. And so, I called him, just to see if he knew what in the hell was going on. Nope, was the first thing he said. Got no idea what you're talking about. I pulled my pillow over my face. Oh, come on, you're breaking my balls, bud. Sounds like you dozed off and had a weird dream. Look, it's an ambulance. Solid black. Runs under full lights, tinted windows, absolutely no sound. Not even engine noises. It's like a Prius or something. Bud laughed. I growled like an underfed kitten, and he said, <laughs> A Prius? Really? Just ask around, you dick. Yeah, yeah. Hey, we're getting a call. See you later. Break a leg, I said and practically heard him flipping me off as we hung up. I sat up and paused at a slight burn low in my chest. Ayla's Danlos syndrome is a bitch, especially when it mainly goes after your heart. After a minute, it faded. <sighs> One of these days, it was going to kill me. For now, though, I wanted some of the cookies Mama had in the oven. The moment she saw me, she steered me upstairs and into bed. I don't like your color, young lady. I'm almost 30. So, you're going to lie your butt down. Good girl. Only after she threatened to tuck me in like a child did she leave to fetch some cookies and a drink. I looked around my room, at the nice, adjustable bed, and the door to the ensuite and the posters of great cities I'd never get to visit. Most of the time, it helped me feel better. Today, I just wanted to drown in some TV. Yeah, inevitable death. You never know when it will get you. A few nights later, I woke with the flames of hell burning my belly from the inside. I groped for my phone and called Mark. She might have been just down the hall, but she can, and once did, sleep through a tornado. Uh -huh, she said after 27 rings, and shushed my dad's grumble. Call 911, Mommy. Her sheets rustled as she sat up. Yeah, right away, honey. I lay back as my mom hung up. The burning in my belly inched towards my chest. Closing my eyes, I begged anything in the universe that this was just a kidney stone, appendicitis, gallstones, anything but what it had to be. The ambulance arrived in a cataclysm of lights and sirens. 
Bard rushed the guys into my room. One look tilted his head toward the mic clipped to his shirt. Twenty-nine-year-old female, Ayla's Danos, vascular type. Possible aortic dissection, getting her to St. Michael's ASAP. He grasped my hand for a moment, and they strapped me to the gun. A couple of minutes later, I lay inside the ambulance, staring at the ceiling as the guy strapped every possible monitor to my body. You'll be okay, Bud said as we tore into the traffic. He kept still, his hand atop mine. His eyes, though, dark and gentle, may as well have been a wall. The siren sounded miles away. I closed my eyes and let the ambulance's rocking lull me to fear. I didn't want to die. I wanted to go to the cities on my walls. London, Reykjavik, Edinburgh, Nairobi, Machu Picchu, Honolulu, Seoul, all over the world. I don't want to die, I said, and Bud rubbed my hand. I know, kiddo. I lifted my head, but a wash of dizziness stopped me from looking around. It was only when we got to the St. Michael's Ambulance Bay that I started feeling better. Appendicitis. <gasps> Gallstones. Maybe dinner was bad, and I just needed to throw up. I lifted my head at a flash of light through the rear windows. Lights flashed. No siren so close to the hospital. I tugged Bud's hand and nodded at the black ambulance waiting behind ours. Bud? Shh, he said, staring at the thing. I squeezed his hand as tightly as I could. Do you think people know when they're going to die? Bud shook his head, his eyes shimmering more than they should, and snorted in a breath. I hope not, Stace. God. I hope not. <coughs> I slowly opened my eyes as dust filled my lungs, leaving me coughing uncontrollably. The sudden loss of oxygen left me in a panic, and I desperately gasped for air. It was dark. So dark, in fact, that I could not see my own hands before my eyes. Trying to move was pointless, as my movements got restricted by what seemed to be wooden walls. What the hell? I thought to myself out loud, before I could distinctively make out an explosion in the far distance. I was beginning to panic even more at this point. The feeling of being restricted of movement, deprived of oxygen, the very thing that keeps you alive and having the fearsome darkness swallowing all of your surroundings, leaving you without senses that you have become accustomed to using at any given time, well, really makes you feel terror in a different way than one would think possible. I was freaking out, and as I did, I noticed how the already low rate of oxygen in this wooden prison was sinking breath by breath. I needed to calm down, I told myself. Panicking will surely lead me to death, and if there was any chance of survival, panic was surely not a part of it. I calmed my breath and felt around in order to make out where exactly I was trapped. To my shock, I soon came to find that what kept me restricted from moving to my will was a coffin. I had been buried alive and lost all prior memory to my awakening. I won't lie, this freaked me out just as much as everything else. However, the sound of a phone message relieved me in a way. I reached down into my pocket and pulled out a phone that was just barely surviving on 10% battery life. If anything will get me out of here, it was this phone, and I couldn't afford to lose even a single second. I promptly turned it on, squinting my eyes together due to the brightness, and to my relief, it wasn't locked by any sort of passcode. I clicked onto the messaging symbol, 
and read the message that had made me aware of my chance of escape. It was from someone by the name of Toby. It read, Hey dude, where are you at? I haven't heard from you since last night. Is everything all right? Getting kind of worried. Last night. I couldn't remember anything as hard as I tried. Anything before my awakening was a blur. I decided that calling him seemed to be the best option. I have to let someone know about my situation before it's too late. And so I rang. And rang and rang. Why is he not picking up? He had just messaged me two minutes earlier. God, I hate people like that. Do they just message you and then decide to throw their phones across the room? Honestly. Well, nevertheless, I went back to the home screen. As what had to be mud came gently falling down onto my face from above just before the sound of yet another explosion sent its vibrations through the ground. Jeez, I'm trying to fucking survive over here. Mind your damn business. <laughs> Chuckling at my still remaining sense of humor, I coughed yet again and resumed back to searching through the contacts. Nothing. Not a single contact, but Toby was on this phone, and that genuinely annoyed me. The one chance of me getting out was busy throwing phones around. Oh, fuck it, I'm ringing 911. I thought out loud yet again. I lowered my thumb back to the home screen button and noticed the thin mud that had entered it, letting it make a crunch sound as I pressed it down to return to a screen with a picture of a triangle and the basic kind of apps you'd find on any phone these days. I went to the keypad entering the numbers 911. It rang. Thank God my connection had not disappeared by now, as it does in most horror stories. A man picked up and asked me what my emergency was, as was probably his script for anyone who would call. Yeah, um, I'm in a bit of a... Another explosion cut me off. I started to hear voices at this point. They were surely not coming from the other end of the line. I could tell that much. Yet again, I began explaining my situation. Um, I, I think I've been buried alive. I don't know where I am. Can you please trace my phone and find me? Just get me out of here, please. No response. Had I lost connection? I moved my phone away from my ear for just a second and glanced to the top left corner. No, I hadn't. The connection was still there, and the phone call was still ongoing. Did he not hear me? But in that situation, shouldn't they call out for the caller? I placed the phone back against my ear and asked, Hello? Can you hear me? A couple minutes passed, and I was ready to give up and find another route of escape as the man on the other end replied. He was simply breathing into the microphone. A raspy, deep kind of breathing that honestly creeped me out. The phone eventually did up losing signal and the call cut off. What the fuck? Did he just leave me to die without an attempt to help me? This is fucking ridiculous. And now the connection is gone as well. Just as panic was about to choke the air out of me again, the voices I heard before became louder. They called out my name, and my heart started beating uncontrollably in relief when I saw the opening of the coffin beginning to be lifted off as light came shining inside with every inch. The voices must have been coming from above me instead of in my head as I'd assumed earlier. The incredible feeling of joy overcame me, and I was attempting to reach towards the opening. I opened my eyes once again. Darkness! My mind was running wild as I realized it was playing tricks on me. It must have been the loss of oxygen that had finally started messing with me, making me hallucinate. 
or so I thought, until I heard the familiar sound of a message popping up on the phone that had just moments before been in my hand. However, it was now back in the pocket where it was when I first opened my eyes. It was Toby. Hey dude, where you at? I haven't heard from you since last night. Is everything alright? You're getting kind of worried. What the... I was trying to wrap my head around what had just happened, but it made no sense. Had I gone back in time to relive this nightmare once more? There's no way. It's impossible, right? But as much as I tried to deny it myself, there it was. The same message, with the same exact sending time. In confusion and desperation, I started banging my fists against the top of the coffin, maybe trying to get someone to hear me. I had no plans left at this point. I retried my prior attempts of survival by calling Toby, but as you can imagine, just like before, he didn't pick up. Neither was there any other contact on this phone apart from Toby and mud came down onto my face once more as I was about to go back onto the home screen. It was a repetition of what I'd experienced just minutes earlier. Again, I rang 911, and was greeted with the same man and the same deep and raspy breath, as I asked if he could hear me. The coffin opened up again, when I once more found myself opening my eyes solely to greet the everlasting darkness, having the same nightmare repeat itself over and over again. It wouldn't stop. I would pull the phone out of my pocket to see the same message from Toby, asking if I was alright. I would search through the contacts just to find Toby's contact, accompanied by no one else. I would ring 911 to be left to die with the same raspy breathing I'd heard so many times before. It was a cycle of hell. I was stuck in some sort of time loop that would make me relive the same horrid twenty minutes of my life over and over and over. After what felt like days, I'd started losing my sanity. Or so I presumed as the only thing changing was the voices I would hear in my head, who would seem to be different voices every time the cycle of hell repeated itself. I don't know what to do. I've stopped calling 911. Hell, I don't even check Toby's message anymore. All I know is that there are two explosions. The occasional sound of my phone informing me that I have a new message, and every time the coffin opens... I'm greeted with the same darkness that will be with me forever, torturing me into eternity. She took the matchbox and struck the match against the strip. The smell of the ignition smoke wafting up to her nose. The luscious smell of smoke finally nullifying in her mind the scent of Laura's skin in her husband's nose. She looked at the lit match and for a brief moment watched the flicker of the warm flame, a beacon of hope and vengeance in the cold bedroom. Her eyes refocused off the flame to the form of Jake's sleeping body. She moved the flame to the comforter at the end of the bed. With a hint of hesitation, she pressed the flame to the fabric, right next to where those grey, lace-trim panties she'd found stuffed into his drawer with an empty love card sat on top of the comforter. It caught immediately, and it grew, lavishly, ludicrously enveloping the fabric and filler of the comforter. The smoke grew higher. From Anna's eyes, she watched the flame devour the bedding above her husband's body, her mind racing about how deep into the bed the fire went. Was the fire carving into those adulterous legs of his body yet? No, 
Probably not, she surmised. He wasn't screaming in horrific pain yet. He was probably just getting toasted. The fire was now sensuously devouring the comforter above his chest. It would be less than a minute before it touched his disgusting face. His head moved to one side. He looked like he was waking in alarm. His eyes opened and within a moment knew something was horribly wrong. He first noticed the temperature, the heat touching his lower body. He screamed and tried to leap up. He couldn't. She'd already tied his arms and legs down. That was the moment he realized he was about to die. His face contorted into an existential terror that his life was about to be lost. But then his eyes met hers. In that one instance he realized he understood how the story was playing out. He knew that she knew about Laura in their bed and now she was murdering him. Oh, oh. She smiled, her hate welling up into her lovely sapphire eyes. No. The flames leapt like a bird landing from flight onto his face and hair. That hair that Laura had grabbed in passion, and it burned the impurity of Laura's saliva off Jake's lip and his face burst into flame, his skin melting. His scream started to be drowned out by the drone of fire consuming its meaning. A few more seconds, and the fire was consuming the bed, the bed of adultery. Anna watched the catharsis of her bedroom. Jake was dead and consumed. The suffering for him was over, but oh, it had been such a terror to his soul for those delectable few minutes, worth every delicious moment. The smoke now filled the bedroom. Anna turned around and walked into the bathroom. She reached into her shorts pocket and took out the six-sided dice. She rolled it on the bathroom counter. It bounced up and down and around and around. She watched impatiently as it landed and showed her what she expected to see. A seven. Anna opened her eyes. She was lying in bed. It was still dark. Jake lay next to her. She sat up. Her body still exhausted from sleep. This one had been very lucid. She had believed she was awake. And that scared her. Because all of the other lucid dreams she'd had, she knew she was dreaming when she'd killed Jake. But this time it felt so real. She grabbed her phone from the end table. 5.24 a.m the time read. Jake wouldn't be up for another 16 minutes. She had time. She went over to the end table on her husband's side and picked up his phone. With her heart on her sleeve, she started reading through his work email. Four messages from Laura. All personal, with a flirty tinge to their content. None business related. She'd first suspected Laura was a threat when Jake hired her as a junior analyst three months ago. It quickly became obvious she had a tiger by the tail with this situation. Laura was all over Jake's Facebook, commenting and liking everything. But then she started to suspect that something more was going on. This was the same time when her lucid dreams had really kicked into high gear. She'd always been able to be lucid, but lately, since she discovered the affair, they had become even more real. 
Anna found things around the house that seemed out of place. Things that to her told her someone else had been here. Someone. An intruder. She knew what was going on behind her back. Why Jake was coming home at lunch. Why he was home early before she got home some days. She mourned hard at first. But then her mourning turned to hate. And her hate turned to murder. She'd played out the murder scene in her mind a thousand times. A thousand times in her dreams. Her lucid dreams. She still wasn't ready to do it in real life. But she did it every night in her dream. And every dream brought her closer to the inevitable. Jake woke up while Anna showered. Then she got dressed and left before he had finished in the bathroom. Her morning was a blur. She didn't want to talk to him or anyone. He texted her around 10 a.m., asking if she could pick up chicken breasts and milk at the grocery store on the way home. She didn't bother responding, but playing the martyr would do it anyway. <laughs> he was still clueless. Clueless that she knew, and that things weren't okay between them. It was 6 p.m. She got into the elevator and rode it down to the lobby. It was rainy and dark outside. The drive to the grocery store was mournful and boring. Tomorrow was her birthday. She could expect the usual from Jake. He would buy her two presents. One, something she was wanting. One, something intimate, like a teddy or lacy underwear or something that his lustful mind concocted. And then a car. She pulled into the parking lot and walked through the wet air into the store. It was busy and well lit inside. She mindlessly wore the aisles and grabbed the chicken and milk and a couple of other things she figured they would need. She turned into aisle six and grabbed some tea. Then, turning the corner over to aisle seven, she stopped abruptly and she almost ran into a woman and her car. Her heart sank. It was Laura. She was in a blue business dress with a beautiful gold necklace around her neck. Her gorgeous hair cascading over her naked shoulders. Had Jake unzipped this dress hours earlier, she wondered. Laura's eyes uncomfortably met Anna's. Anna stared in cool anger. Laura looked away, then looked back at her. Hi, Anna, she said cheerfully. Anna didn't say anything and moved past her. Right after they passed, Laura spoke out. Hey. Laura stopped. Her face was genuine, as much of a farce as that could be. I just want to tell you that I really respect you. Jake talks about you all the time when I'm with him at the office. He loves you so much. Anna nodded. Thank you. Uh, hey, we should all three get dinner one night, Laura proposed, hopefully. Anna nodded and faked a smile. Yeah, that'd be nice. They parted and Anna went down aisle seven to get her last items. Anna stood in front of the bed. She had stood here a thousand times over a thousand nights, her mind turning over and over the interaction she'd had with Laura at the grocery store. Her fingers mechanically lit the mat. At the base of the bed were those grey lace panties, the ones she'd found hid away in Jake's drawer. She pressed the fire to the bed, this time without hesitation. It felt real, just like every other time. The fire consumed the comforter and sheets, like every other time. 
A minute later, Jake woke up and screamed. He howled in horrible pain as he suffered. This time, though, it lasted longer than before. Maybe she was processing the events at the grocery store. Maybe it was just different. But his suffering sounded so brutal. His eyes met hers with a fear she had seen over and over. But his eyes looked a little different. Like he didn't understand what was happening. Why he was tied down. Why he was burning. The other times it was undeniably clear that he knew the truth. He burned and burned alive until the life of him was consumed away. The bed exploded in bright flame. Then she turned around and walked to the bathroom. She took out the dice and rolled it. It bounced around like every other time. And it landed on a six. In my county, there's an old quarry lake. At its deepest point, it's more than 50 feet deep. The shockingly clear water lets you see most of the lake bottom. When you're swimming there, it looks like a forest of lakeweed, far below your feet. Then it drops off into the pit. The pit is what we call the deepest point of the lake. It's far too dark to see the bottom there. There are a plethora of urban legends surrounding the pit, from mafia body dumping to a great sea serpent that sleeps at the very bottom. I personally don't lend much credibility to these legends, because the quarry is still the number one swim destination for locals in the summer. I often swim there, but after dark, when I have the place to myself. I love to float in the middle of the lake and gaze up at the stars, letting the refreshingly cool water carry me. The air is still hot, but there's no risk of sunburn. The moon and stars turn the calm waters into a silver and indigo work of art. The woods around the quarry are full of fireflies that dance and flit among the trees. Oh, it's the perfect way to unwind after a long day at work. This is where I found myself on a Friday night. The day had been unforgivingly hot, almost reaching 40 degrees at noon. The water was so deep that it almost always stayed cool, though. There I was, floating over the pit. Air stiflingly hot above, water blissfully cool below, my legs hanging over the abyss, the stars shining brighter than they ever could in the city. A tickle. Something brushed my ankle, ever so daintily. My body went tense, pulse racing, fear Blind panic. Cold fire in my veins as I flailed like a fish out of water. Kicking. Escape. Escape. Swim. But how? Fire in my lungs as I forgot how to breathe. I coughed up water as I managed to get my bearings. I swam for the shore. The dark water no longer welcomingly cool. It was cold. The cold weighed my limbs down as I swam, exhaustion threatening to drag me down to the very bottom of the pit. But I was halfway there. Something touched my ankle, almost managing to grab it. I kicked frantically, my foot connecting with something slimy and covered in lakeweed. I swam faster, the water seeming to get colder to the point where it felt like icy fire. I felt myself slowing down. The cold and exhaustion were getting to be too much for my body. No, I had to go on, just a little further. I had to get away. The thing was right behind me. I could feel its presence. A hand gripped my ankle, pulling me underwater towards the pit. 
My panic scream was cut off as my head went under water. Water filled my lungs, cold and burning. I choked, wanting to vomit. The light of the moon grew dimmer and the farther down I went. The pressure built up, my ears aching as I felt myself being crushed. I kicked, connecting with the hand holding me. Oh, it was strong. I flailed and kicked, air escaping my tightly shut lips as I resisted the urge to scream. Finally, I managed to wiggle free. Adrenaline burned in my blood, fear propelling me to the surface where I gasped and drank in deep lungfuls of the sweet night air. I made it to the shore, gasping and spluttering. I dragged myself out of the lake, collapsing on the shore. I sat there, catching my breath, relieved to have escaped. A shape broke the surface. My heart stopped. It was too dark to make out what it was, but it was getting closer. I scrambled to my feet, running for my car. It looked slow, but it was coming for me. I cut my feet on gravel as I internally thanked myself for leaving my purse under the driver's seat and the car unlocked. I made it to the car, locking the doors and scrambling for my keys. I yanked out my purse, hearing the distinct sounds of keys falling to the floor. Oh, shit. I fell to the floor, reaching under the seat. I saw my glow-in-the-dark keychain just out of my reach. No. I sobbed as the chain rested inches from my grasp. I looked to the window, seeing that the thing had already made it out of the water. It was approaching quickly, staggering on legs that hadn't been used on land for a long time. Then, I remembered it. I have a jacket hanging up in the back seat, on a coat hanger. Yes, the coat hanger. I sprung into the back, snatching the hanger. The thing was circling my car. God, I could smell it. It stank of rotted meat and lake scum. Wait, how could I smell it? My heart dropped as I realized. The window. The passenger side window was open a crack. I doubled my speed, reaching under the seat uncoordinatedly with the hanger. It hooked onto my keyring as I heard a soft, wet sound coming from my window. I grabbed the keys, looking up and seeing the monster's face pressed against the glass, a rotted arm reaching in through the opening. I screamed. All I could do was scream and scream as I gazed into that horrible face. It may have once been human, but years of rotting at the bottom of the pit had reduced it to a fleshy pulp. Lakeweed hung from what remained of pale, grey flesh. Black teeth grinned out from its exposed jaw. Its eye sockets were occupied with a pale blue fire. They stared at me with a deep hunger as a fleshless arm reached for me. The mouth opened, filthy water pouring out and spilling in a black waterfall down the thing's chest. A gurgling moan escaped from deep within it. I jammed the key into the ignition, slamming the car into gear. The thing seemed to realize what I was doing and retracted its arm at shocking speed. It managed to get out of the way as I slammed on the gas and tore out of the parking lot. I sped home, tears of horror pouring from my eyes. When I arrived, I got into the shower not leaving until I had washed away all of the horrible clinging chill. I looked down, realizing to my horror that my ankle was stained black from the thing's grip. No matter how hard I scrubbed, the stain wouldn't come out of my flesh. I sat in the tub and cried. 
I was still shaking from fear when I heard the front door open. No. Stupid. Why the hell did I leave the fucking door unlocked? Habit? Yeah, we don't lock our doors around here. I jumped out of the tub, slipping on a puddle on the floor. I grabbed the bathroom door handle and locked it, then pushed the chair against it for good measure. God, how did it find me? My car? Oh, it recognized my car. The car I didn't put in the garage today. Oh, God. I can hear it outside now. It's trying to get in. I'm curled up, wrapped in a towel in the corner. There isn't a phone in here. Maybe I can wait until someone notices that I'm gone. Yes, yes, I'm supposed to visit my parents tomorrow. I don't think it can get in before then. Maybe they'll call the cops? God, please, please let them call the cops. I need someone to find me. Well, I hope you enjoyed that collection. Just over an hour's worth of stuff for you there this evening. And I'm sure every man, woman, boy, girl, and their cats and dogs are all going to be putting out a video today. So if it's a few days later for you, and you've just made it here, it's all good. I'm glad you could join me anyway. Anytime, place, anywhere is good for me. <laughs> well, hopefully we'll be back again on Friday. And I'll see you all then, won't I? Of course I will. But for now, happy Halloween, sweet dreams, and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon. So, come check me out, okay? <laughs>